Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have everybody in again. And uh, once more, we're going to go right back where we left off in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And we're going to pick it up in verse 13. Jerry's got 14 on the board, but we'll look at verse 13 first. Okay, for those of you joining us on television, in case this is the first program that you've caught, we're just an informal, non-denominational Bible study. I don't know how many different groups are represented here in the studio, but uh, we don't pay attention to that. We're just going to teach the Word, and uh, as I've said so often, we just let the chips fall where they may. I don't expect everyone to agree with me on every point. We don't have to. There's certainly room enough for disagreement as long as we're on the basic fundamentals of who Christ is and what He's done and the inerrancy of the Scriptures and some of those good things uh, that we will not uh, have any room for compromise. Uh, I think uh, I can go right on into the Scripture without any more announcements or any more ado. I think they're uh, letting the folks know at the end of the program what's available. But let's go right back into 1 Timothy chapter 1. And uh, we'll uh, start the program with verse 13, where Paul, of course, still writing to this young man, Timothy, during this time that he's out of prison and uh, probably has a year or two until he's taken back and arrested and whereupon he will be martyred. But now then, as he speaks with regard to that ministry that Christ gave him in verse 12, he goes back and he never forgets the fact that he was a persecutor and a blasphemer and he was injurious, in other words, to those Jewish believers who had embraced Jesus as the Messiah. But, flip side, even though he was the greatest enemy of Christ on the earth at that time, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. But, again remember that the grace of God was poured out on this man without merit. He had no reason to spare him. God could have just as well zapped him and taken him off the scene. Instead, he decides or he has uh, chosen to use this man to become then the apostle of this gospel of Grace. Now, I'll never lose sight of the fact that Saul of Tarsus was intensely religious. Saul just lived and breathed his religion. And in the name of his religion, he thought nothing to put the adversaries to that religion to death. And he hated the name of Jesus of Nazareth because he thought he was an imposter. He thought that he was something that went against Judaism. And consequently, he was then, as he says here, the persecutor of those Jews who had believed who Jesus was. Now verse 14, and the grace. Now, no writer of Scripture uses that word as often as the Apostle Paul. Just check me out. Go to a good concordance and you'll find that Paul uses the word grace almost more than all the rest of Scripture put together. And so he says, the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. All right, but let's go back and take another look in Acts, if you will, with me. And go back to Acts 26. I think we looked at it in our first program this afternoon. But I want you to see the thinking of this man as he was headed now to Antioch up in Syria to gather in those Jews who had become believers of Christ's Messiahship, even though they were living outside the land of Israel. Now that tells me something. That tells me that the Jewish leadership had enough clout with Rome that Rome would actually extradite these Jewish people whom the Jews wanted to arrest. Must have. Because he couldn't just go up into a foreign country and like kidnapping people and bring them back. So there must have been an agreement with Rome that they would permit this to take place. But whatever. Now he explains it in the first person in Acts chapter 26. 
And uh, oh, let's see. I sometimes don't always know just exactly where to start. But he said, let's start verse 4. Let's start verse 4. And remember, he is speaking to King Agrippa as he has now been arrested by the Jewish authorities who are, of course, trying to get rid of the man. But now he's rehearsing before King Agrippa his, his life up through Judaism until he became an apostle. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation, that is, among Israel, at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, <clears throat> who knew me from the beginning. In other words, from his family beginnings up in Tarsus. If they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, which was that one day God himself would come in the person of the Messiah, the Son of God, to be the King of Israel. All right, and so this was the promise to the fathers. Verse 7, unto which promise our twelve tribes, the twelve sons of Jacob, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. In other words, that Paul is now proclaiming that this one who had been crucified and risen from the dead was the one promised to Abraham and the Old Testament prophets. Now verse 8. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Paul's admitting. Verse 10, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. Now here it comes. And many of the saints, that is, the Jewish believers that Jesus was the Christ, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they, these Jews who were under Saul's persecution, and when they were put to death, I gave my vote against them. Now I know the King James used the word voice. I don't know what your other translations have, but the marginal is vote. Now that implies, of course, that Saul of Tarsus must have been a member of the Sanhedrin because they were the ones that voted to put these people in prison or put them to death. And so I take from this, and now I'm writing, running into other writers who are taking the same approach that since he was a member of the Sanhedrin, it was a requirement, just like Paul's requirement for deacons and pastors, that they had to be a husband and a father. And of course the premise was, how can you deal with things unless you know how to deal with a family situation? And so the Sanhedrin was a, a consortium of husbands and fathers with children who were the, more or less, the religious governing body of Israel. And he's a member of that. And as a member of that, he voted to put these Jewish believers to death. Now again, stop and think. Who must have permitted all that? Rome. They couldn't do this without the Roman authorities knowing it. And so I have to feel that the leaders of Israel had enough clout with the Roman government that they could carry out this kind of execution with no opposition. All right, reading on. Verse 9. No, verse 11. And I punished them off in every synagogue. He was unrelentless, persecuting them. And I compelled them to blaspheme. Now, how do you suppose he did that? I think torture. I think he literally was able to torture these people into finally relenting and recanting their faith in Jesus of Nazareth. And I compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even to strange cities, which of course was Damascus. Whereupon 
as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. And then he goes on to say how that the Lord arrested him there, you might say, at the gates of Damascus and brought the man to his knees, whereupon he said what? Who art thou, Jehovah? And Jehovah says, I'm Jesus. Well, you know, I always like to make a point of that. Can you imagine how the man must have just melted like butter in a hot sun when he suddenly realized the name he hated was the same Jehovah that he worshipped? Quite a come off, wasn't it? And yet that is what I think drove the apostle for the next 20 some years that regardless of how many beatings he took, regardless of the stoning, the shipwreck, the suffering, he never forgot meeting the Lord Jesus face to face here on the road to Damascus. It must have been a face to face experience for the apostle. All right, now then, if you'll come back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14 again, and the grace of our Lord Jesus was ex exceedingly abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. And now then we're going to look into a part that I feel very few people can comprehend. And again, I don't expect people to agree with me until they see it with their own eyes. But I think it's so obvious that here Paul is going to show that he is the first, the head of the line of this whole composition of believers from every walk of life, from every racial background that have come in to make up the body of Christ, which remember is only used by Paul. You will never find the term the body of Christ any place but in Paul's writing. Never does Peter refer to it. Never did Jesus refer to it. It is a Pauline revelation, the body of Christ. So I feel, and I don't condemn people if they don't agree with me, but I feel that Paul must have been the head of the line. Now let's look at it. <clears throat> Verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. There's no room for argument that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That is for sure. Of whom I am chief. Now, every sermon that I've ever heard on this verse, and I imagine everybody else has ever heard, they're pointing out what a wicked sinner Saul of Tarsus was. And that if God could save Saul, he could save anybody. But the word chief doesn't mean that. The word chief in Scripture does not mean the worst. It means the first, the head man. Now, we're going to show that from Scripture. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 22, and we're going to look at the word chief. Luke 22, verse 26. Matthew, Mark, Luke 22, verse 26. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom Paul is the chief. All right, but what's a chief? Uh, Luke 22, verse 26, but Jesus is speaking, and he says, You shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, or the head man of your group, let him be like someone who serves. How's the word used? Wicked? Sinful? No. But he that is chief, who is the head man of your group, let him condescend to be the least. But all I'm showing is that the word chief does not mean sinful or wicked. It means the first. Acts 14. Acts 14. Verse 12. Paul and Barnabas are <coughs> now up there in Asia Minor. <coughs> and they have performed a miracle. And uh, all these pagans are all shook up. And uh, they begin to think that uh, these men were gods of some sort or another. And uh, they begin to worship them, see? And so uh, 
My goodness, I lost my place. Totally. What was it? 1412. I'm looking at 1214. Thank you. Uh, Acts 1412. Okay. And they called Barnabas Jupiter, and they called Paul Mercury, because he, Paul, was the chief speaker. Does that mean he was the most vile, the most sinful, the most wicked? No. He spoke with the most authority. He was above Barnabas. He was the first of the two. All right, we can go on to the next one, and that would be in uh, Acts 28. Yeah, Acts 28. Acts 28, verse 7. <clears throat> Acts 28, verse 7. We're still showing the same thing, that the word chief in Scripture does not mean sinful or wicked or the worst. It simply means the head man, the beginning of the line. Verse 7, Acts 28, in the same quarters. Now remember, this is after their shipwreck in Acts 28, and they're on the island of, uh, where is it, Melita? And uh, the serpent, I think, has, has just bitten Paul. Yeah. All right, now then, verse 7. In the same quarters, there were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. Now, was Publius the most wicked man on the island? No. What was he? Probably the governor, the head man. He was the chief man on the island. Am I making my point? Never does chief mean worst. All right, got one more. Romans chapter 3, verse 2. And again, Paul is showing the advantage that the nation of Israel had. They had the temple. They had the priesthood. They had the miracles of God. But the most important thing going for Israel was in verse 2. But let's read verse 1 so we get the flow. What advantage then hath the Jew? What profit is there of circumcision? Well, much every way. The Jews had so much going for them. But chiefly, because unto them were committed the oracles or the Word of God. You know what the word means? But the number one reason they had the Word of God. All right, so now I hope I've established that the word chief does not mean the most sinful or the most wicked. It merely means the head of the line or the first one of a group. All right, back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, that is, by grace, of whom Paul says, I am at the head of the line. I'm the first. Now verse 16. How be it, for this cause, so that he could be the first, I obtained mercy, grace, Mercy, love, I obtained it that in me, and again, what's the next word? First, not second, not hundredth, but that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Now stop and think a minute. Was there ever a greater manifestation of the grace of God? Then when God saved Saul of Tarsus, never, never. He was the most wicked so far as Christ was concerned that had ever lived. They didn't come any worse, always in the name of religion. But he hated Jesus of Nazareth. He just detested him and was doing everything, even murdering adherents of it, to stamp it out. All right, 
So now then he obtained the grace of God, the unmerited favor, that in him first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. In other words, his patience, his love, and again, his mercy, his grace. Now then, in him first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a, what's a pattern, for goodness sakes? What's a pattern, ladies? Come on, you all go to a fabric shop, I think, at some time, whether you're young or old, and what do you do with a pattern? Well, it's the beginning. It's the original of whatever you're going to make. And if you make three or four or five of them, what are you still going to use? The pattern. You know, I think I gave the illustration years and years ago. I was cutting rafters one day, and I was just a young man, and my dad came along, and I had rafters cut, you know, all over the place, and he said, which one is your pattern? Gosh, Dad, I don't know. I just use whatever one I pick up. He said, you're going to have a roof that's as sway-backed as an old horse. Why? Because I was not using the same pattern with every cut. And it's the same word here. The Apostle Paul is the original. Verse just comes to mind. Didn't intend to use this. Come back to 1 Corinthians, honey. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Got it? 1 Corinthians 4, verse 16. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 16. And this follows right along what we've just been saying. If he is the pattern, now look what it says. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of who? Me. Why? He's the pattern. He's the first. Turn over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Oh, this will make people feel a little bit better because, see, they come back to me, I'm not going to follow Paul. I follow Jesus. Well, now, wait a minute. If you're going to follow Jesus of the Gospels, I usually put it this way, only to make a point. If you're going to follow in his footsteps and he comes to the Sea of Galilee and he can keep right on going, what are you going to do? Well, you can't follow, but this man I can because he's just as human as we are. He suffered the same pains and passions that we do. And now look what he says in chapter 11, verse 1. Be ye followers of me, why? As I follow Christ. You see that? No, that's so logical. That's so logical. Oh, the ascended Lord has given Paul all the instructions for everything we need. And as he listened to what Christ told him and wrote by inspiration, we can rest assured that we can follow this apostle. All right, back to verse 16. We've got to go quickly. I've got one more portion of Scripture I'd like to cover yet before this half hour is over. Verse 16, reading on. Albeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first... Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should, what's the next word? Hereafter. Now I'll go back to my rafters. After I had three or four cut, where should I go back? To the pattern, not to the fourth or the fifth one. And it's the same way here. You don't follow somebody else that came later we follow the one who is the pattern of the grace of God. Now then, reading on, that he's a pattern to them which should from that point on believe. See? Believe. He doesn't say anything about all these other things that came from Peter and Christ in his earthly ministry. Now it's a matter of exercising our faith in his gospel. All right, I got one more portion of scripture that tell us the same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Hope I've got enough time. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And oh, if this doesn't just make it so plain. Now remember, he's the head of the line, he's the chief man, and we're to follow. 
Everybody comes in, I feel, after the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> now chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, starting at verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. That's like a vineyard as he used the parable. But Paul also uses another analogy. You are God's building. We are building a part of that which pertains to the body of Christ. All right, verse 10. Here it comes. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, not because he deserved it, he was the least, but God made him the chief. All right, and as it was given unto me, as a wise master builder, now stop. If you were to build a new home, or if you have already built one in the past, when do you ask your contractor to come in and take over? When the building is a fourth finished? No. You find your contractor before you even set the stakes. He's going to set the stakes of where your foundation is going to be. Isn't that right? That's the master builder. Now, according to most of Christendom, Paul comes in when the first floor is finished. Jesus and the twelve laid the foundation. They built the first floor. Now comes Paul and adds to it. No, he doesn't say that. He said, I am the master builder. I'm the one who has started from the scratch. Read on. I have laid the foundation. Jesus didn't lay it. You know, I appreciated one magazine years back said, Jesus never started anything. Well, I couldn't agree more. But look at the next verse. For other foundation, verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay. Not Peter, not John, nobody. No other foundation can be laid than that which is laid. And who's the foundation? Jesus the Christ. That's the foundation on which Paul's gospel rests. That's the foundation on which our whole eternal destiny rests. And from that foundation, our faith can grow and can build. We bring in other believers, and all these believers together are making up what Paul alone calls the body of Christ. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.